All right, hello everyone, my name is Nick Weiss. I'm the founding member of NP Weiss Law. Uh, thanks for joining us. Thank you to the Cleveland Metropolitan Bar Association for helping us uh, put this on, this webinar. Uh, we hope it will be useful to Cuyahoga area landlords, particularly Cleveland area landlords, uh, given the uh, new requirements that have just come out with Residents First, the existing requirements with lead inspection and lead abatement, and the, uh, especially the new requirements for rental registration that everyone's going to have to be dealing with. Uh, my name is Nick Weiss, I just said. I've been doing this about 10 years. Um, and uh, with me here also is uh, Rachel Kuhn. Hi, everybody. My name is Rachel Kuhn. I'm an attorney here at NP Weiss Law. Um, I've been practicing in real estate law for about 11 years now. And um, even prior to law school, I worked for a local real estate developer um, for several years. So I've been in the real estate business for about 17 years altogether. And I'm a native Clevelander and I live in the city of Cleveland. So I see a lot of the confusion and things about the new requirements going on around me in my own neighborhood. Cool. And we're also very fortunate to have Zach Burkins here with us. Hi, Zach Burkins. Uh, I own a company called PB Free, which is uh, the largest at this point uh, processor of lead safe certificates in the city. Uh, my background is about 20 years as a property manager, 15 as a court appointed receiver, and the last three pro almost exclusively as a lead tester. And I'd be happy to help you with any questions you have. And what we're going to be doing uh, today is we're going to be talking about uh, these different requirements. If you are uh, on Facebook, if you're on LinkedIn, if you're looking at this, you should have a chat function, an ability to ask questions. Uh, we're very fortunate uh, to have uh, the, the CMBA assisting with that. We would like to try to answer your questions in real time. So as we're talking, if you have something that you'd like us to say, we will be uh, made aware of your question. Um, there's a lot to go over here, uh, certainly more than we can answer in an hour. Um, and so this is kind of the broad strokes that we're going to be providing. Um, so if you have something specific, uh, we will be happy to answer it now. If we run out of time, uh, we'll be happy to contact you after the webinar and try to answer that question as best we can. Uh, so to start, the biggest thing that has happened most recently is a series of ordinances that the city of Cleveland has grouped together called Residence First. And if you're on the webinar, you're probably already familiar a little bit for uh, what this is and what this entails. Residence First has put a tremendous number of new requirements on landlords in Cleveland proper, and particularly new requirements on out-of-state or out-of-county landlords in Cleveland proper. Uh, that is for the different registrations that landlords have to uh, enter into. That is for the different disclosures that landlords have to make to both buy and sell property, uh, as well as uh, making sure that these properties are clear before those transfers can be made. Um, in addition to that, there are huge implications as a result of these new requirements to what you as a real estate investor, what you as a developer have to do if you have a property that was built before 1978. Correct. January 78. That's right. Uh, and we already had existing lead requirements in Cuyahoga County. Zach's going to talk a little bit about that. But now, especially in Cleveland, these are all the more important. So, But I want to start uh, our discussion here with the basics for any kind of transfer, any property transfer, if you're buying something here in Cleveland. There are a couple of things that are mandatory anyway. Uh, already, you should be familiar with the residential real property disclosure state. That is for the transfer of any residential property, and that includes whether we're talking about uh, commercial to commercial. You have to disclose on this form known defects. If you don't know about any known defects, that's fine. You have to disclose these known defects, though. If you fail to do this, or you buy a property where someone has failed to do this, uh, that is where uh, Rachel, that is where I come into play. That's where a lot of litigation lies. This is a very, very easy form to fill out. It's only a few pages. And if you check no on all the boxes saying, I don't know anything, you're probably safe. But you still have to do it. And the failure to do that means that we bill you a lot of time and you're very unhappy. And, and 
that form applies whether that property is owner occupied, vacant. Um, there are very narrow exceptions as to when that form does not have to be filled out. One of the most obvious is it's not going to be filled out if somebody buys a property at a foreclosure sale. You're not going to get that. That's probably the most common exception. Other than that, um, in general, that form does need to be fill out, filled out whether you live there or not. Um, we've seen in some of our litigation cases where somebody just wrote N.A. does not occupy on it. That is, that's not valid. Uh, no, and it's so not valid that if you received one of those, you should call us if you're having issues with your property because that is something that can either be uh, rescinded or you can bring damages for for that bad disclosure. Um, the other big thing, especially in Cleveland now, and we're going to talk about uh, this a little bit more, is your lead disclosure statement. This is mandatory on a federal level. There's federal law that says you have to disclose your knowledge as to whether there is lead in a property, if it was built before January of 1978. Uh, if you don't do this on a federal level, you can be sued for damages. That can be liquidated, that can be punitive, that can be attorney's fees, that's suits from people like us, that's uh, suits from other people suing you for failing to fill out a very, very easy form. The reason we're talking about these forms is we know, because we clean up the uh, the refuse that a lot of investors are not using title companies when we make these purchases, a lot of them. And there are some good reasons to do that, there are some good reasons not to do that. But we know that we're not including the right forms and that it is exposing people to tremendous liability. These two are easy, they're gimmies. They take about a minute and a half to fill out in their totality. Okay, If you don't do this, you run the risk of a fraudulent non-disclosure claim, um, which is one of the more common uh, cases that we deal with here. Uh, for most cases for residential real property, um, if you don't disclose something that could not have been uh, found by any kind of reasonable inspection, you are on the hook. And you're not only on the hook uh, for the actual damages, but you can be on the hook for punitive damages and for reasonable attorney's fees. Take the minute and a half, take the two minutes, fill out these forms. They are available online. If you Google them right now, you will be able to find them online. Um, and Cleveland is, itself has its own local ordinance on this. If you don't do this, and there is lead poisoning of any resident, you are going to be on the hook for actual damages, for punitive damages, and for reasonable attorney's fees. That's both on the federal and Cleveland level. Other basic one, please, 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 please register your entity in the state of Ohio. This is a requirement uh, just generally in Ohio, but also one that is specific to Cleveland. If you do not do that and you transfer property, that is a misdemeanor. That is a criminal citation for not doing that. And something else that your attorneys, that we or whoever's representing you will have to deal with. Again, that's on the Ohio Secretary of State's website. It takes about 10 minutes to set up your own account there and then to file your foreign registration if you've got an out-of-state entity. Okay, new stuff for these transfer requirements. The biggest one is in Cleveland called our Certificate of Disclosure. If you have a residential property that is one to four units and is not on, uh, on any kind of vacant land, which is a whole separate thing that we're not going to go into today, um, you are required to obtain from the city of Cleveland, you have to make the request yourself, this certificate that's going to outline everything wrong with the property, supposedly. It's going to outline whether there are any lead citations, whether there are any uh, hazard control orders, whether there are taxes that are due and owing, whether there are any kind of citations, anything that is there, okay? And any active notices of violation. And that has to be given to the other side for that transaction to be valid. If you're using a title company, this isn't going to come up because we already have a local ordinance that says, title company, if you screw this up, you're liable. Not only civilly, but also criminally under the statute. But I know a lot of you aren't using these title companies, right? The reason for this, if you make this transfer and do not have this certificate of disclosure, that transaction can be rescinded and you don't need a good reason to do it. It can be because you didn't like the color of the paint. It can be because it's a Tuesday. 
If you don't make this disclosure, an action can be brought against you to give you the property back and make you pay back the money. This can go both ways, right? If you bought a property recently and did not get one of these disclosures, we can put the property back. If you think you've been lied to, if you think that something hasn't been disclosed, that's what this local ordinance will do. You can rescind the transaction, plus liquidated damages, plus any other things that we can think of. These are the basics. These are the big changes for any transfer requirements. Please, 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 please get this certificate of disclosure done. Don't have to give back the money on the property you just worked so hard to sell. Don't have to get involved in a lawsuit for a property that you just purchased. Okay. All right. And landlords, anybody who owns rental property in the city of Cleveland, um, I'm going to go over the requirements for your rental registration. Um, just a brief overview of these requirements, and I'm going to go into some of them in a little more detail in a minute here. Number one, and this is new, you must have a local agent in charge. And again, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. You must have your um, lead safe compliance, which is good for two or 20 years, depending on the situation. We're going to talk a little bit more, probably a lot more about that um, coming up here. You must be compliant with all fees. You cannot have any outstanding citations, violations, or fines on your property in order to get your rental registration. You cannot have any open code violations, whether you know of them or not. Um, you cannot have any open code violations. Um, you must be current on your property taxes or you must have a payment plan in place that you are complying with and current on. Um, all of this must be done through a website called Excella Citizens Access that the city is running. And I understand, um, Zach and I, we were talking about this a little bit last night. It's, it's currently not functioning, though. It has not been functioning since before the first of the year. <laughs> okay. Um, so. However, I was assured yesterday by the director that next month is the month for it to turn on. Okay. Um, and if you own four or more units um, in in the same parcel, so you own a four or more unit building, um, you must also have a current utility statement showing any and all utilities that the landlord is responsible for are paid in full, and you have to have an annual HVAC certification. Um, you are required to get an inspection done annually by a licensed HVAC contractor. There is a specific form that needs to be filled out and submitted on the City of Cleveland's website for this certification. Um, these are new requirements by the City. of. Some of them have been in place for a while, but, but some of them are new, and the City is really cracking down on these as part of that Residence First legislation. Um, these are required for all owners of non-owner occupied real property, um, residential real property. This includes property that is owned, um, but you don't occupy it, um, property that's occupied by a family member, a friend, whether or not any sort of compensation is being exchanged. So people who have property that's not in their name for estate planning purposes, maybe you own property, or you, you live in property, but you put it in your children's names, or some other type of arrangement, if you have property that is not being occupied by the people whose names are on the deed, these requirements will apply to you. Um, so, so be aware of that. Um, if the property is in the name of an LLC, again, as Nick mentioned, you need to have current filings with the Ohio Secretary of State. You need to have your LLC registered. Um, once you register an LLC, those registrations are good for five years. You do have to fill out a form every five years to renew that. Um, one thing that's really important to do with your LLCs is if you move or change your statutory agent, that form needs to be resubmitted and updated. Uh, we have come across a lot of cases where we're trying to serve an LLC and that um, property owner or whoever it is that we're trying to serve has moved and not updated their statutory agent with the state. 
it is still deemed good service as far as the the court is concerned because we served the agent that was registered with the state that person never got it because they didn't update their paperwork so make sure that if you um, have properties in the name of a, of a corporate entity in the state of Ohio that you are keeping that up to date if you change your statutory agent that will renew that for a period of five years. Um, so every time you update that for, for whatever reason, it will start that five-year clock again. Um, Do we have a question? Okay, we have a participant who would like to know, is there a list of all the links necessary, all the necessary paperwork mentioned? Uh, so there, that does not exist in one space. On the uh, Cleveland website, you have to kind of uh, go around and know that all of this stuff exists. We will be updating uh, this video with a list of what we think are the essential lists. And mm -hmm. if you have signed up for this webinar, you will be given those and that will be sent out after the webinar. Moving all forward. right, moving forward. Um, I'm going to talk in a little bit more detail about the local agent in charge. Um, this is a new requirement for the city of Cleveland. This is a big change. Um, this so so listen up <laughs> as part of the residents first legislation um, this is one of the, the biggest things that they added the goal here overall for the residents first legislation but in particular this requirement is to prevent out-of-state investors from hiding from the courts and not being able to be found um, the reason some of the reason behind this is the city of Cleveland has a grading system it uses for its properties and it noticed that properties that were graded in A or B dropped from 78% in 2015 all the way down to 54% in 2023. So the quality of properties within the city of Cleveland has gone down. Um, in, in At the same time, the number of vacant properties, blighted properties, and properties that are not owner-occupied has increased. Um, and the number of out-of-state investors has increased. So in order to kind of combat the difficulty in finding these out-of-state owners, this local agent in charge requirement was put into place. What this requires is all non-owner-occupied residential properties. Um, if, if the property owner does not live in the city, in Cuyahoga County or a contiguous county, you have to have a local agent in charge registered with the city of Cleveland. This is in addition to when we talk about your LLC and having to have a statutory agent registered with the state. This is separate and in addition to that. Okay, I've had a lot of clients when we've been talking them through this process ask me, well, I already have a, a statutory agent with the Secretary of State. This is different. This is separate. So you still need to have this local agent in charge. This must be a person, a human person, not an entity. So if I own rental property in the city of Cleveland and I don't live in, in Cuyahoga or an adjacent county, I um, would have to go to my buddy Nick here and ask Nick Weiss personally to be my local agent in charge. I couldn't have an LLC um, of a property manager or some other entity. It must be a human person who resides within Cuyahoga County. This can be a property manager, it can be a real estate agent, it must be a human person. I've had a couple instances, instances working again with clients trying to get these, paper, um, these papers filled out and filed with the city where they've put corporate entities and we had to go tell them go back and, and redo this again. Must be a human person. That person then accepts agrees to accept service of process for any violations or other notices issued by the city um, they are on the hook criminally and civilly for any and all violations the same as the property owner and in essence they step into the property owner's shoes um, if there is a violation the city will try to go after the property owner and pursue them first but if they can't be reached and the violation is not addressed, then they will go to this local agent in charge. So they do agree to accept civil and criminal liability, um, the same responsibilities as, as the property owner. There is a requirement for the property owner then to indemnify that local agent. 
Um, that's basically fancy legal word for legally pledging to make them whole. So if, if they foot the bill and, and get your, your civil or criminal penalties, then you're going to make them whole and you're going to pay them back. Um, there is on the City of Cleveland website, again, not all of this is in a convenient one-stop location, but on the City of Cleveland's website, there is an affidavit form that has to be filled out by the property owner and also by the local agent in charge and submitted. It is a specific affidavit form that you have to fill out for this and notarize. Um, and notarize. Both parties need a valid photo ID as well in order to submit this paperwork. Um, while we're, we're mainly here to talk about the city of Cleveland, there are some other local municipalities that we work with, um, with property owners, um, that have rental property. And I know that Cleveland Heights also has a similar requirement. They have their own form. So if you own property outside of the city of Cleveland, um, this may or may not be a requirement. It is a growing trend that some of the other, um, suburbs are, are starting to adopt if they didn't have this in place already. They will also have their own specific form that will need to be filled out, probably notarized, and filed. So that is the local agent in charge requirement for the city of Cleveland. Again, this is this is new, and this is probably one of the biggest changes with the residents first. And I, I just want to point out one more thing because I've I had a couple of questions about this um, on some uh, prospective landlords and existing landlords. The purpose for many for getting the LLC, the LLC owned property is two. One is the obvious one is a limitation of liability, right? So that that entity is the only one that can get hit by a civil or criminal uh, charge by the city of Cleveland, right? But the second one sometimes is anonymity. You don't necessarily want your name on uh, that LLC. Sometimes it's an LLC within an LLC or uh, some kind of, we now have series LLCs in Ohio. We can do something like that. Cleveland is making it much, much, much harder to maintain that anonymity. Many steps along this process, particularly the registration, to get an LLC, they're going to want to know who the owner is, right? And, and all the owners. And all the owners. So if you've got multiple owners of a single entity, you're going to have to disclose that. That's pretty onerous, right? And there's no way around that. So any other municipality that we're talking about, Rachel mentioned Cleveland Heights is one, you may still be able to protect that anonymity, but it's going to be much, much harder in the city of Cleveland. Um, can I jump in on one thing on the local agent? Sure. Uh, just so you know, there are, as you can imagine, not a lot of people who are looking to become local agents in charge. You're taking on a significant amount of liability. Uh, I have received about a dozen inquiries. Uh, I am accepting applications, it would be a definite, uh, I need to go out and see the property, evaluate it, have a good relationship with the owner, so that if push does come to shove, I've got someone I can call and make this happen. If you or any of your clients do need a local agent in charge, you can feel free to contact me. We'll get, I believe they have my contact information already? Yep. Yes. Uh, you can feel free to contact me about that. Thank you. Yeah, and I just want to point something else out. From, a, from an administrative perspective, if you've got multiple properties, even just one property, obviously it is going to be easier if your property manager is also your local agent in charge. It does not have to be, but certainly easier. We are encountering situations where we have property managers who are unwilling to serve as that local agent in charge because of that additional criminal and civil liability. Right now we're putting indemnity clauses in contracts, we're doing that, uh, but you may struggle to find someone who is willing to serve in this capacity. So mm -hmm. this is not just talking about how great Zach is, it might be hard to find someone. So give him a call. And we, we've talked as well about with, with, with some prospective um, local agents and, and their property owner about doing um, an indemnification agreement that would be something that both parties would sign. Um, if that's something you're interested in, certainly please give us a call. We can, we can talk about that. Yeah. And uh, currently, uh, despite our, uh, we've really worked on this. We are not aware of any insurance policy or any bond policy that would cover a local agent in charge. To our, you know, best of our knowledge, that product does not exist. So these indemnification agreements, if your local agent in charge wants one, they're going to be pretty tight. They're going to put some significant restrictions on you. Yeah. Okay. Good question. Good question.
Okay, question is, uh, what if you don't have a property management company? So, certainly you can own a property without a property management company. Um, we do not think that that's best practice. When we frequently tell people the first thing to do is to get a property manager, get a property management company. They will know all of the things that we're already talking about here. Talk about the different registration requirements, talking about uh, lead safe when we get to that, all of that stuff. You are going to be learning a lot, particularly if you're new on this, mm -hmm. right? Um, but it can be you, right? If you live in Cuyahoga County, you can be the local agent in charge, right? That's, that's allowed under all of this uh, to get around that rule. I still don't think it's a good idea, and I'm sure both Zach and Rachel have horror stories about people trying to do this without pro property management companies. Mm -hmm. You can do it without. We try to tell you not to do that. Especially if you are out of state or not local, um, you need local boots on the ground. You need somebody who can run over to your property if there's ever an issue, who can appear in court on your behalf without you having to travel a significant distance for an eviction or some other type of hearing. You need somebody local. This is, a, you know, we say out of state, sometimes it's out of country. We represent quite a few European investors here. Um, and sometimes we've got a couple of cases here. Their property manager just bails. They're just gone and we can't find them. Uh, they've gone off to Florida, which is where I am convinced all bad property <laughs> managers end up going. Um, but Mar-a-Lago, Mar yes. Weren't you just in Florida? <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes. <laughs> kidding, kidding. Um, <laughs> but make sure that these are vetted, right? Um, check reviews, check people. If you've already got counsel, they will know people. They will know property managers that they work with and are going to be really tight about giving recommendations out because, as many of you have probably already found out, it's very easy to find a bad property manager. So we have a, we put, uh, Zach has put together uh, a little video uh, to be helpful to summarize a lot of this. So I'm going to switch over to there. Oh, we got yeah. a question here first. I've been told property with a LHCO not declared in 2020 can I have the cell canceled? So it depends on when you bought it, right? If, uh, if you bought it after the enactment of this ordinance, obviously, you know, if you're getting a lead hazard control order, you did not get a certificate of disclosure, right? Because you would have known about that. So if you bought the property after these ordinances were put into effect, yes, we can rescind that. If you bought it before that was put into effect, unfortunately, you're, you just are subject to that lead hazard control order. We've had a couple of cases where this mm -hmm. hasn't been disclosed, and you can sue the guy for not disclosing that. Um, but for many, many of these, what we find is that these people have moved. They're out of state. Sometimes they're out of country. They've gone to Florida. They've gone to Florida. Uh, and some of them are just not collectible or did it under uh, their own LLC or something like that. It is... Uh, a struggle. It's very difficult to bring actions against these sellers who sell properties under these Les Hazard control orders. You now have a remedy now, but if you bought in 2020, best we can do is sue for fraud. How does the new residents' first legislation affect Laidlords? In January 2024, the city of Cleveland enacted first of its kind, residents' first legislation to better regulate the rental property market. The goal of the program is to provide more even administration. Before 2024, the only avenue the city had to force compliance and fines was via the Cleveland Municipal Court process. This proved problematic as many owners, in particular LLC and out-of-state investors were difficult to serve. The result is thousands of unregulated buildings, often falling into disrepair and eventually becoming vacant local agent in charge. What are the components of residents first? If the property is titled in a corporate name, such as an LLC, the property must have a local person, not corporate entity, located within Cuyahoga County. That agrees to both receive service of the infractions and most importantly, will be financially liable to the city for all violations of the code and fines. The prospective agent in charge must attest to a document acknowledging that he or she accepts the specific financial responsibilities for this property. New Rental Registry 
currently the system has many loopholes. It is estimated that nearly 40% of rental units in the city of Cleveland are not properly registered. Lack of registration is now enforceable by civil fines. Owner paid utilities. Property owners must provide evidence to Thew City that their owner paid utilities. Heating, gas, sewer, water are either current or on a payment plan. Real estate taxes. Owner must provide proof that real estate taxes are either current and or on a payment plan. Owner paid utilities. Completion of the above requirements will result in a certificate of good standing, which is required for you to be a legal rental and to get a date in court. Under residence first, the city can now issue civil tickets, $200 per unit per day. Tickets that remain unpaid will be applied to your property tax bill, thus making it difficult and more expensive to keep and eventually sell your property. Fafai property tax arrearages compound at 1.5% monthly. Selling your property, residence first prohibits transfer of properties, absent a certificate of good standing. While the tax and water sewer issues will be handled at closing by title companies, all the other components, rental registry and lead safe. Absent this certificate, the county clerk is not permitted to transfer title to a new owner. This operates similar to the point of sale inspections in many suburbs. For assistance with coming into compliance, please feel free to call our office at 216-452-0881 or Birkins at papriohio.com. We have the ability to expedite late test results in as fast as one day. We have another uh, question, and it's from the same qu uh, questioner from before. Can I still sell the property if I can't pay for all the requirements, or what can I do? So right now, the answer is no, right? There are options for a, uh, a owner to take on some of these obligations themselves. And in the past, when we've done point of sale inspections and that kind of stuff, which is the traditional way to do that, you could do that so long as you put a specific bond amount or a certain uh, amount up and showing that you could do that. There is right now no mechanism to do that for these kind of violations in the city of Cleveland. It does not exist in the, in the local ordinances. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing some instances where we do have properties with violations, old hazard control orders or, or other issues um, that the person, that the owner who bought the property didn't know about, and they're now trying to sell the property and trying to get that cleared and get the paperwork through the city and, and get all of our ducks in a row so that that violation is taken care of and addressed. Um, it, it's holding up the sale of properties. So if you find out that something, that there is an issue with the property that you own that maybe even existed before you bought it, try to get that cleared up and we're going to talk about some best practices in a few minutes here but you want to get that cleared up immediately um, as quickly as possible so that if you get to a point where you are trying to sell it doesn't hold up a sale or you risk losing a potential buyer because of of the delays um, but let's talk about lead sure did we have one more question yes oh we did okay. okay okay the question is i have applied for lead grants do i have time for them to help me my property lead safe zach you want to you want to run this one how about this it depends <laughs> uh it depends on what you there. applied for through which agency uh was it through the city was it through the county was it through the coalition was it through cleveland housing network that's a pretty broad question and uh, i'd be happy to speak with you offline uh, but in general speaking the easiest money to get and it's just sitting there waiting for your clients to pick it up, is the rebates that come from the lead coalition. Now, we'll get into the actual lead exams themselves in a moment, but the lead coalition right now will rebate you up to $750 for a two-year exam and $1,000 for a 20-year exam, subject to some restrictions. They're not onerous, and I won't go into it here, but there is money available to assist you to coming into compliance, but they only give you the money after we have someone who has said uh coalition city has a one-year wait list i'm not surprised i'm gonna leave it at that <laughs> um but let's get into it zach let's talk about lead everyone's favorite subject <laughs> um okay 1978 1178 is your cutoff date this is not the date that you rehab the property so i'm going to give you a good example 
Terminal Tower, built in 1920-something, bought by K&D in, I believe, 14, gutted and renovated in 1516. They were still subject to this ordinance, despite the fact that there's no possible lead in there. We went through, did a complete 20-year exam, and they are now certified. So just because uh, you bought the building and took everything out to the studs, that does not exempt you, but you could get a 20-year exemption, which is a good deal. Typically, about 90-plus percent of the units in the city of Cleveland will not be able to get a 20-year exemption. I'll get into that in a moment. But your typical property that was built, uh, let's say, before 1950, if it, unless it has been gutted all the way back to the studs since 1950-ish, chances are very good you cannot get a lead certificate. I'm sorry, a 20-year lead certificate. However, my firm does offer free testing with an XRF gun, so that we can go out there and tell you within about five minutes whether it's got a very good chance of passing or failing. But let's stick to the two-year for right now. It's a little longer process, but let me walk you through it. Once I get the call from the landlord and we set this up, I assign two different people to the job. The first is a cleaner. All they do is clean. They go into the property, they clean every single window, as long as it's safe, as long as you can reach it safely and it's not blocked by furniture. We, we don't move furniture, we don't want damages. Uh, that person cleans and pre-cleans, which is something you can do yourself, and I'm happy to give you the directions. They take care of that. Then at least 60 minutes later, pursuant to Ohio Revised Code, a different person, the tester, does come in and tests the windows and the window areas. The cleaning does not guarantee passage. The only thing I can guarantee you is that it will be prepared in as good a potential fashion as possible. When you or your clients call me, one of the first things I ask is, do you have wood or vinyl windows? If the answer is wood, I always tell the potential client, you need to be aware that given the current constraints, I'm lucky if I can get one out of ten wood windows to pass, as opposed to vinyl where we're easily over 98, 9%. I mean, it's, you're good with vinyl. So that is one thing to keep in mind. The tester comes in, tests 13 swabs per unit, and must do a visual of the entire inside and outside of the property, including any out structures, such as garage or, or storage shed. They must provide pictures of these to the city. If the city sees any chipping, peeling, or people don't understand it, but it's the law, bare soil, it will be failed and you will need to start again from start. Uh, I can walk through any of that with you or any of your clients at any time. Once we get the dust wipe samples, I send them off to a lab, fast forward about 10 days, I get the results back. If it passes and the visual inspection that came along with it and the pictures all look good, I will be happy to complete an application for you that is part of our service. I will send it to both you and the city. At that point, it leaves my hands. Once it goes to the city, I cannot control the pace at which it is reviewed or anything else. I hear about it usually after you hear about it. Uh, when I get a call from a client saying, we got a deficiency notice, I had not received it yet. So you have to plan ahead. My suggestion to people, don't wait. Before your client lists a property, if you're out looking to buy properties, when you're buying a property even in cash, put into that contract must have valid lead certificate at time of close because if they don't you should be able to get out of it uh, and if you're going to sell your property I encourage you highly to get this certified not only is it the law and you can face some substantial penalties without it but calling us today saying I've got a closing next week it's gonna be very difficult for us to get it into you and I assure you the city if I take four days to get it done the city's not gonna do it in three so your sellers need to plan in advance, perhaps 60 days before they sell, to get this done. Not only do they need to be legal currently as the owner, they're going to need this prior to the transfer. I have had calls from several people that are very upset because this potentially can wreck a 1031 exchange schedule. I can assure you, the IRS will not be extending deadlines for the lead certification or telling them the paperwork is with the city. That's just not going to happen. The IRS is very strict. I believe it's the 45 and 180 day rules. Yeah, yeah. 45 to identify, 180 to close. Miss that? You just lost that tax exemption and that could blow the entire thing. Uh, so now we've got you the certificate. I send it in. 
Well, let me back up one step. Let's say when I review the results, there's a problem. And it could be a very slight problem or it could be a major problem. I let you know, I'm a licensed lead risk assessor. I let you know exactly what failed. If it's under six square feet, you can repair it yourself. If it's over six square feet, you must use an RRP licensed contractor to do this. And I'm happy to provide referrals. Uh, I have no financial incentive in it whatsoever. You are required as the owner to, after I give you the referral, make the contact to the contractor, work out the contract, and then call me back after such time as that those repairs have been made. But you have to bear in mind here, the city's current reading of the ordinance, which I don't agree with, but it is the current reading, is that all of this must be done and complete within 90 days of that first wipe. So if I did a job today on May 8th, you basically be looking, you'd be looking three months from now. You'd be looking at August 8th. Everything needs to be tested, if potentially needed, retested, repaired, and submitted to the city 90 days from now. However, realize that when I go to do the retest, I need to plan to get back in there. I have to do the exams, send them to the lab, receive the results, and write the application. 90 days really should be looking close to 60 to 75. If you can't do that, it's going to be a problem, and the city will make you start from scratch. Uh, so that's the two-year, and we, do you want to go to the incentives now? Or like, yeah, let's do that. Okay, yeah. the incentives. Once you get your two-year certificate, you will get a letter from the city. And two things you need to know. Federal law requires you not only to disclose these lead results in full as part of your disclosure papers, it also requires you to give a copy of the exam to every tenant, every renewal, and anyone who walks in the door to apply. Here's the problem. A report such as the Terminal Tower was almost 300 pages long. I think it's rather impractical to be killing that many trees. So what I have suggested to landlords is they take the one page document from the city that says you are certified through this date, right on the bottom of it, actual results available upon request, and then electronically transfer upon request and attach that one page. That will save you wasting reams and reams of paper. I believe that will fall within the guidelines, you know, that's I guess between you and your lawyer, but I think it's a pretty good compromise there. Uh, so now you've got your certificate. At this point, you go to a different department, the coalition, which is a nonprofit that collected money from ARPA, Cleveland Clinic, University Hospitals, Mount Sinai, a host of different people. They have about $100 million that they're supposed to help landlords come compliant. You will then fill out a one-page application on Google Sheets Online. It should take you no more than five minutes. You will attach to that both your W-9 as well as uh, your one-pager from the city. You will send that in. For reasons unbeknownst to me, it is taking many, many months to get that through, but that is the process. So when people tell me, well, you said I can get money back, I tell them, Ed McMahon's not coming to the mailbox, so don't wait there. <laughs> it will come, and my clients have received hundreds of thousands of dollars, but it will come and take time. Yes, question, please. If I understand all my investment is lost if I can't put any more money in it after many losses already. Uh, that is not incorrect. Uh, there are properties, for example, here in the city of Cleveland that may have, uh, maybe you paid 10000 for it, you're hoping to sell it one day for twenty, but you suddenly find out you have a lead violation. The city can now ticket you $200 per day per unit, and if you don't pay it, it goes on your property taxes and accrues at 1.5% monthly. So it will cloud your title. Yes, there are going to be some properties that just cannot meet these standards. The best move would be to tear it down. I don't have good legal advice for you. I would turn to learned counsel uh, who can tell you better what to do, but it is a distinct possibility. There are there are some workarounds, you know, certainly if your, your building is in a, a single entity, for example, and you are gonna roll the dice on selling that entity to someone that contains the building. You know, we, we've seen that before. The problem is that especially Cuyahoga Fiscal Office are really cracking down on those kind of transfers, mm -hmm. on those, what we sometimes call drop-down mm -hmm. transfers. We, some can still sneak through on this, but particularly because we have the new disclosure requirements for every property transfer, that's happening less and less. They're getting really good at flagging those mm -hmm. and then requesting more information. Um, particularly articles of organization, um, information about the LLC, et cetera, et cetera, that especially if you've just got your 
hundred dollar, I filed an LLC, and I put it on the Secretary of State's website, you're not going to meet those requirements. Um, so there are workarounds, but they are limited and they are shrinking daily. Mm -hmm. um, going back to some of the questions we received in advance of this, how am I going to pay for the abatement? I personally am not a lead abatement contractor. I stick to one side of the aisle. However, I can make referrals to you uh, or your clients of qualified lead abatement contractors. A very typical question I'll get is somebody calling me up saying, I bought this, co this property nine months ago and I just got sued by the city for a lead hazard containment order. That LHCO, lead hazard containment order, bars me from doing anything until a licensed lead abatement contractor has gone in there, contracted with you, done the work, and reported it back to me, at which point I need to follow up and do a clearance exam. Where's the money coming from? There is some good news on the horizon. Currently, and I've been working for about two years now, to get a bill pushed through the House, it is called HB 280, and part of that bill will take what is right now a completely underutilized, the state has been putting aside $5 million a year into a piggy bank for this. In the last fiscal year, they only gave out 42000 of the $5 million, less than 1%. Reason being is that the current tax credit is non-refundable, which means if you make less than 250 AGI, it's not worth the paper it's written on. And the health department currently uh, interprets the legislation to say that it is only available to individuals or state. I'm sorry, individuals or trusts, which 99% of your good landlords are going to have an LLC for the obvious reasons that Nick talked about. Uh, this new legislation will take it from non-refundable to fully refundable, make it valid for all pass-through entities, LLCs, trust anybody who has a tax ID should be able to pay for this, apply for this. What it will do is it will give you up to $10,000 per unit in tax credits to make these repairs. It's money that's already sitting there. So, for example, if you have a client uh, who, after her taxes, has a tax liability to the state of $100, but you did $1,000 of work with me and you have a $1,000 certificate. At this person's next tax return, that 100 will be zeroed out and the state will cut your client a check for $900. This is going to be key because lots of the landlords in the areas that are most stricken by lead paint are not making $250,000. And they've been so far been shut out from this. This will change this. I encourage you to call your legislatures Ask them to support HB 250, oh, sorry, 280, and its center com Senate counterpart that went live this week, Senate Bill 253. Again, I remain ready to answer any questions I can about that. Um, yeah, and that, that is huge. Um, if you are following any of our social media, either MP Weiss or PB Free, um, you'll know uh, if and when this passes uh, because we'll be jumping for joy on this. We'll finally have a uh, usable system for investors to actually be reimbursed for being good landlords, for being good investors, and doing the remediation that is very necessary. And I think everyone watching agrees it's very necessary. It's also very expensive. And we're finally putting the incentives in place, hopefully, yeah. that will allow for you to make these kind of repairs and this remediation at a substantially reduced cost. Other things that the legislation does do, as written right now, uh, it codifies the ability for any landlord who receives a deficiency letter to have 180 days from the date of that deficiency letter to retest what's needed. So, for example, I had a client, I won't mention the name, at Shaker Square, a uh, very well-known guy, he has 19 units. 17 of them passed. Two did not. He was nowhere able to get windows within 90 days. Under the current reading, all 19 units fail and he has to start from scratch, a very expensive proposition. Under this new requirement, under the new legislation, he would have 180 days from the date of the deficiency letter, not the date of the first wipe, to fix that, come into compliance, and simply redo the units that failed. Uh, also, one of the big complaints has been time that the report sits in queue at B&H. Now, they have got better. Uh, a year and a half ago, it might have been 80 to 90 days. They are claiming now that they are at about 32 days. Under this legislation, if passed as written, any time they are past 30 days, it can be reported. If they, lose, if they have 50 of those instances in one year, I believe it's a calendar year or a fiscal year, I'm not sure. If they have 50 of those, the city would lose 
10% of its local government fund, which is not what I want to see happen, but the legislatures have all felt that the city needs skin in the game too. That 10%, which roughly is $3.5 million, would go back into the pot of money to distribute to landlords. And likewise, if it happens 200 times in a year, they would lose 20%, which is $7 million. Again, I do not want to see the city losing money on this, but there has to be some skin in the game and some timelines. Yeah, it's, a, it's a huge stick to beat the city into actually processing what needs to be processed here. So another question there? Yeah. Do private homeowners need to comply by these lead regulations, or is this purely targeted at investors? Two things there. One, as far as the Cleveland ordinance goes, Today, and much to the dismay of many landlords, it is simply for rental property. Your rental property must be passing. However, the house next to you, which is owner-occupied, could have, it, it, may, it may look like a snake shedding its skin with lead blowing everywhere. They're not on the hook at this point. I don't agree, but that is the current law. The second part, though, is that if HB 280 passes, it is available for every residential structure, regardless of its owner-occupied and investment how it's held in title, it is available for that. So individual homeowners can use the money in HB 280. I, I want to be clear, though, that when we're talking about the different lead requirements, there are, there are some lead requirements that even as a private mm -hmm. owner-occupied structure, you're just going to have to meet. We've talked very early in the beginning here about that lead disclosure. If you have actual knowledge of lead in your property, you still have to disclose it. You still have to do that, or you are liable. If someone purchases the property, and then gets lead poisoning somehow, right? So there are still some requirements that you as a private owner have to meet, but it's nowhere near as onerous as what we're talking about for non-owner-occupied structures. And to add to that, um, many of the landlords watching or attorneys watching need to know that almost no landlord policy covers lead paint. Yeah. They will cover you for nuclear war, for terrorism, for gang violence, but lead paint is specifically excluded. So if you or your clients are saying, well, it's okay, the insurance company pick it up, no, they won't. You need to know that in advance. What happens in those cases, and this is particularly applicable to Cleveland because it has its own ordinance, is you get sued, you get a judgment against you, and guess what the biggest asset is that they can put a lien on for that judgment? It's the house you are renting out. And that is the order of events, if you don't do that disclosure. We are uh, speaking of uh, risks uh, as a result of all of these. We're talking about the, the new uh, uh, methods by which residents first are uh, enforcing these new ordinances. So, Rachel, mm -hmm. do you want to go? Yeah, so a lot of um, what used to be criminal penalties are now civil tickets. So things like proper trash disposal, um, pests, smoke alarms, exterior maintenance issues. Uh, I just had a client call me because they had tires. They got cited for used tires all over the yard. Um, grass, the most common one of those that we see is, is the grass not being mowed. Lead safe certification, the requirements we just talked about. Portable storage containers. Graffiti removal. I know that's been a hot topic um, in, on the near west side. Um, graffiti removal has been a, a hot topic of, of civil tickets. Um, the penalties for these tickets um, include all costs and expenses incurred by the city. They are $200 per day per unit or $6,000 per unit per month. You um, only have 30 days to appeal this ticket, and if not paid in 30 days, balance is added to your taxes. Um, so sometimes if you're looking at properties on the auditor's website, that's you'll see those um, charges for things like the grass being mowed. Those then accrue, as we mentioned, on the taxes at, at the rate of 1.5% a month, and there's a nine-month uh, nine appeal process. So... I guess um, moral of the story is keep up with your property, keep up with that routine maintenance, the lawn mowing, the making sure things are cleaned up. If you have tenants that are causing these issues, make sure that you are addressing those with your tenants and, um, and, and avoid this altogether if at all possible. That will save you a lot of headache and heartache down the road. Um, and also make sure that if your tenant comes to you with issues that fall under something that could be cited, 
um, if, if they submit a maintenance request to you that you're staying on top of those and being timely with addressing those. Okay. So, and we, we just talked about best practices there. A lot of these also apply to, to criminal citations, right? Mm -hmm. But if you've got a criminal citation, um, you know, it's, it's going to be harder. You are going to, especially if you've got an entity, you can need to hire someone like us, right? You're not going to be able to go down. Your property manager is not going to be able to go down, give you a not guilty plea, get everything in the system, right? Mm -hmm. You've got those additional expenses already off the bat. And if you don't know about it, we've got quite a few cases where we've got the judgment, where we've got a show cause filed, where we've got contempt filed, mm -hmm. right? And because of the new service rules and residents first, those notices could all just be posted on the door. And so if you don't have someone watching the property, you could have that first violation, then compounding daily, then a show cause, and then $60,000 in fines added to a judgment, which is then going to impede your ability to sell the property, right? Um, if you get into that, compliance, 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 mm -hmm. yes, we can go in, we can file motions, we can fight things, but what the court wants at the end of the day is to show that you fixed the issue. And so 90% of the time, if you can do that, your consequences are gonna be yes. much lessened and we'll be able to actually get you out of those heavy fines. Yes, every time I've been in court with a client who's had, especially the criminal citations and the criminal penalties, we are, they always emphasize, the prosecutor, the magistrates, the judges, always emphasize our goal here is compliance. We are more concerned about compliance and less concerned about the money. And we have been able to get um, sometimes tens of thousands of dollars of penalties set aside for a client over a citation that they actually took care of, um, that they didn't even necessarily know about, but they took care of the issue. They just never properly addressed the citation and the subsequent court filings because they weren't aware of them. So again, timely routine maintenance, upkeep, tenant concerns, just timely staying on top of those and addressing those has really saved a lot of our clients in the long run from these civil penalties or, or criminal, criminal fines that they didn't know about until a couple years later. If for some reason we were not as brilliant as I hope that we were, our contact information is here on the last slide. This PowerPoint will be made available to you if you signed up to the webinar so that you'll have all of that contact information. I hope that if you do have questions, you'll reach out to myself, you'll reach out to, to Rachel, and you'll especially reach out to Zach on these lead issues, which are going to become a lot more prominent very, very soon. Thank you very much for your attention. All right. Thank you. Thank you.